Welcome. Uh, I'm Robert Dycroft, Director, Neil Levy Professor here at the Institute for Advanced Studies. It's a great pleasure to welcome you to the first of a series of lectures uh, created and organized by Jonathan Haslam that uh, I hope all of you know joined us this summer as the uh, George F. Cannon Professor in the School of Historical Studies. Uh, and this lecture series, which is called the World Disorder Series, is aimed to explore international relationships uh, and dilemmas that policymakers are confronted with since the ending of the Cold War. And the aim of the lecture series is uh, not only to have uh, expert speakers who uh, are, have a deep knowledge of the current global environment, but also to hear some kind of fresh perspectives and uh, some unconventional approaches to the subject. Uh, and I think we all are uh, assuming that the speakers actually th think of this as a honorific qualification. Um, and I think we couldn't have a better speaker to open this series as Michael Pattis, who's professor at uh, Beida, Peking University. Um, he's a Wall Street veteran uh, of Bear Stearns and Credit Suisse First Boston, and he will discuss China's tumultuous stock market and its impact on the global economy. And as always, at the end of the lecture will be Q&A, and then there will be a reception in the uh, common room at Fould Hall. So just a few words of uh, our uh, chairman today, uh, Jonathan Haslam, a leading scholar on the history of thought and international relationships, in particular the Soviet Union, that he joined us this, uh, this summer. And he made significant contributions to our understanding of contemporary phenomena viewed through the lens of uh, the Soviet uh, and Cold War experience. I think many of you, I hope, have attended his kind of maiden speech, his public lecture that he gave here at the Institute uh, on uh, Vladimir Putin and the post-Soviet Russia. If you have missed the lecture, please go to our website. You can find a nice link of the video of that. Uh, his most recent publication was Near and Distant Neighbors, a new history of the Soviet intelligence, published last year which kind of charts the uh, labyrinthian story of Soviet intelligence from the October Revolution all the way to the Cold War, to the end of the Cold War. And it was actually chosen by The Economist as one of the books of the year 2015. And so without any further ado, I would like to ask Jonathan to come up to the stage and introduce uh, tonight's speakers. Thank you very much. Um, do come in at the back. Um, it's a great pleasure to welcome Michael Pettis here. I have a side interest in China, and I've been spending um, an inordinate number of years just to be able to say hello, how are you in Chinese. Um, and in that time, I got interested in the Chinese economy, and, and really from about 2008, the, I was trying to find an expert who had sort of organic sense of China and understood the place and its dilemmas. And finally, I found Michael Pettis's blog. And I really recommend you read it. Um, certainly you will after this lecture. Um, because he got it right when everybody else was getting it wrong. And as those of you in the business probably know, getting it right too early is a terrible thing because everybody says how useless you are. And then when they start to realize you might be right, they've forgotten you ever said it. And somehow um, the consensus is all yours. And Michael, with the recent events on stock markets, has um, probably found this to be the case. So I really recommend you follow on from the talk with questions uh, we have a reception, and then you read his blog. And it's all available right the way back if you care to look. Okay, over to you, Michael. Uh, thanks very much, uh, Jonathan, for organizing this. It's uh, my honor to speak here. Thank you especially for organizing this weather. It's bitterly cold in Beijing. I can't believe it's February here. Um, now, Jonathan says that I understand China, but you know the joke about China is that after six months, you know pretty much everything there is to know about China. And after 10 years, you don't know anything. And I've been there 14 years. 
So what I want to do is tell you a story about China's development. Um, and I think that'll help understand development since the late 1970s. And I think that'll help understand the challenges that Xi Jinping and his administration face. And I think the challenges are enormous. I think there is um, the options that China faces are a higher probability of many years of much, much lower growth and a lower probability, I still don't think it's likely to happen, a lower probability of some kind of debt crisis. And the, the, the difference between the two is really not an issue of economics. It's an issue more of political economy. And uh, I'll explain that or try to explain that in the next few minutes. Um, we think of the last four decades as being a single brilliant growth model um, that China has been following basically since the late 1970s or early 1980s. And I don't think that's a very useful way to think about China. For me, it's much, much more helpful to break it up into four different periods, which sort of neatly uh, confirm to each of the decades, but not necessarily. Um, and it's when we understand these four different stages of this growth model, and it seems like, in a sense, what we have to do now, the fourth stage, is very similar to what Deng Xiaoping did in the first stage. Um, under very different conditions though, so with uh, possibly very different results. So let me go through these uh, periods. As many of you know, in the 1980s, in the late 70s and 1980s, um, China had a real economic problem, a whole set of problems. Um, and Deng Xiaoping's great uh, changes, or his great reforms, consisted of what I would call liberalizing reforms, removing a whole bunch of constraints on the ability of Chinese individuals and Chinese entities to behave in productive ways. Um, but liberalizing reforms historically always face a problem. And I, I, I recently sent an email, I don't know if he got it, uh, to Professor Edelman here, who wrote a wonderful book on Albert Hirschman, one of my favorite economists. Um, and Hirschman talked about these a great deal. One of the questions that Hirschman asked is, why is it that when we implement successful policies in developing countries, their very success undermines the need for the continuation of those policies. And yet we never seem to change, we never seem to reform or reverse those policies in time. And why is that? And his answer probably won't surprise anybody, is that those policies create a, a, a group of institutional supporters, which we sometimes refer to as the vested interests, in China we call them that, that benefited from those policies and they typically prevent any changes, uh, any reversal of those policies. And this happened in the 1980s too. There was a great deal of opposition um, to Deng Xiaoping's reforms by the Communist Party elite, but power was pretty heavily centralized in China at the time in the Standing Committee, most of whom were allies of Deng Xiaoping. And the PLA was fairly uh, loyal to him, and he was able to implement the reforms in spite of tremendous opposition. Um, there's been, I've tried to look back in historical periods of similar implementations of such radical reforms. Um, and Darren Osemoglu, kindly enough, did a series of papers in the beginning of the last decade where he looks at these types of reforms. And he argues that it's very rare that they're successfully implemented. But when you look at successful cases of implementations of such radical sets of liberalizing reforms, the successful cases tend to occur on either end of the political spectrum. And I think that also sort of makes intuitive sense. Um, he argued that democracies are pretty good at implementing these types of reforms. And maybe the classic example would be uh, Franklin Roosevelt in the 1930s. In fact, the 1930s periods has a lot to teach us about what Deng Xiaoping has to do, strangely enough. Um, or they occur at the other end of the spectrum with highly centralized autocracies. And the classic example there may be China in the 1980s, uh, the reforms that Deng Xiaoping implemented. Um, in one case, in the case of democracy, because the benefits of reforms are widely spread out, it's possible to overcome elite opposition and in the case of a highly centralized autocracy, again, it's possible to overcome um, um, elite opposition. And I think that's very important to remember. 
Um, so these reforms were implemented, they almost immediately were successful if you think of them in terms of growth. In 1978, I wanna say, uh, China's GDP grew by negative, negative 1.7, please don't quote me on that, but it was around that, that number. After 1978, I think there were only three years until last year where we had growth below 7%. Um, and those three years, I want to say uh, one or two of them towards the end of the 1980s and the rest in the beginning of the 1990s. So they were immediately successful from an economic point of view. Nonetheless, there was tremendous opposition. In fact, the famous Southern Tour in 1992 was primarily, as I understand it, primarily uh, um, aimed at overcoming opposition in the South to continue continuation of his reforms. But by the 1990s, it was pretty clear that there was not likely to be a significant reversal of the reforms. But you can only get so much growth by removing constraints. Removing constraints allows you to get some growth, but after that it stops. Uh, China's had four decades of extraordinary growth. Um, so it was not just enough to remove those constraints that Deng Xiaoping did. China needed some kind of growth model. Um, and it turns out that there is a, a growth model that we've seen used over and over again, depending on how you define it. There may have been as many as 30 cases of growth of more than 10 years of greater than 7% since the Second World War. And these are what I would call investment-driven growth miracles. The, the first one to be called a miracle was really um, uh, Brazil in the late 50s and 60s. Um, but they all have a couple of uh, uh, qualities in common. And for those, uh, those of you who are interested, I strongly recommend one of uh, Albert Hirschman's uh, uh, colleagues, um, Gershenkron, who talks about the constraints that developing countries face. That's not my phone, is it? Oh, okay, sorry. Um, the constraints that developing countries face. He said that basically developing countries tend to face two very important constraints that prevent them from becoming developed countries. Um, the first is they tend to have insufficient savings to fund their domestic investment needs. And there's many reasons for that. It could be bad financial systems, it could be political instability, uh, lack of property rules, uh, lots of reasons for it depending on the countries. But as many of you know, this characterized the United States in the 19th century. U.S. savings were insufficient to fund uh, domestic investment. And so we basically borrowed from England and the, the, the Netherlands and a few other countries. And it's easy to tell because the US ran current account deficits for most of the 19th century. So of course, if you're running a current account deficit, you're running a surplus on the capital account. So it's basically, we used foreign savings, uh, British savings for the most part, uh, to fund our investment needs. Now, one of the questions that, that, that to me is a very interesting question and I don't have an answer for it, is in the 20th century, we developed this idea that to depend on foreign savings is incredibly risky, and it has been. Countries that have depended on foreign capital to generate growth have uh, typically ended up in crisis. And so an interesting question is why didn't that happen in the, uh, in the 19th century? I don't have an answer. I suspect it may have to do with the form of the capital. British capital, came into the U.S. mostly in the form of equity, purchases of land, purchases of companies, um, whereas in the 20th century, because of reasons of nationalism or whatever else, foreign capital tends to enter in the form of debt. And I think that could be the key difference, but I'm, I'm just guessing. Um, but at any rate, to depend on foreign capital, Gershon Krohn argued, was a big problem. So, one of the things that developing countries had to do was to force up domestic savings. Um, it turns out, conceptually, it's not that hard to force up domestic savings. Savings is simply GDP minus consumption. So to force up savings is the same thing as to force down consumption, right? Same thing. How do you force down consumption? Well, it turns out that that's not so hard either, conceptually, because most consumption is household consumption. So if you constrain the growth in household income, then you will also constrain the growth in household consumption and the savings rate automatically goes up. I wanna make a quick digression. One of the things that infuriates me is when people talk about savings, 
as if the only kind of savings there is is household savings. It's not true. Household save, government save, and corporations save. So in the case of China, it has the highest savings rate in the world, not because the Chinese are the most prudent people in the world. The Chinese spend more or less out of household income um, the same level that other poor Asian countries do. China has the highest savings rate in the world not because of its households, but because households, uh, uh, cor corporations, and the government all have relatively high savings rates. So it's the national savings rate that's the problem in China, not necessarily the household savings rate. And I'm going to explain in a minute why that's really important. But um, to get back to Gershon Krohn, if you constrain the growth in household income, then you will constrain the growth in consumption, and so you will force up the savings rate. And every country that's had one of these investment-driven growth miracles has done just that. And there are lots of ways you can constrain that. Um, in Russia, my understanding is, and I'm not a Russian expert, but in Russia, my understanding is the, the most effective way of constraining the growth in consumption was basically through scarcity. You had money, you just couldn't buy anything with it, right? So they constrained consumption growth that way, and the savings rates were quite high up until the 1970s when they began borrowing internationally. Um, in the case of Brazil in the 1960s, it was mostly very high income taxes. So with these high progressive income taxes, you, you reduce the growth in disposable household income, and because of that, you reduce the growth in consumption, and so the savings rate went up. China, uh, Brazil had high savings rates until the early 1970s, when for a bunch of reasons that sort of dissipated, and the model, the growth model should have ended there, but for those of you uh, who are interested, it's really interesting to see what happened in Brazil. Because rather than stop, for better or for worse, we had the, uh, the, the surge in petroleum prices and the uh, uh, huge increase in deposits by OPEC countries in the international banks, which had to be recycled. And countries like Brazil borrowed a great deal. <coughs> I say for better or for worse because while Brazil grew very quickly in the 70s, which was actually a pretty bad period for the US and Europe, but Brazil continued to grow very quickly, they did so probably by um, exacerbating what was already an investment problem, an overinvestment problem. I'm going to get into that in a minute. Um, but Brazil resolved that in the debt crisis of the 1980s. Some of, some of us are old enough to remember the famous LDC debt crisis. And that's where I started my career, trading that stuff. So I am very, very grateful for the uh, oil crisis. Um, there are other ways of constraining the growth in ho household income. The Japanese version, which is the version that China and most other Asian development miracles followed, was to use a series of hidden taxes to constrain the growth in household income. Now, there are lots of uh, different kinds of hidden taxes. Basically, in economics, we think of any transfer of wealth from the household sector to the state as a kind of tax. And there are many ways these can happen. I apologize, but jet lag always makes me incredibly thirsty. Um, environmental degradation is a kind of transfer, isn't it? Because if you're allowed to dump chemicals in the river, that's a subsidy for businesses, right? They don't have to pay for all of that. And that subsidy is paid for by households in the future in the form of higher medical bills or um, uh, not showing up at work, things like that. So there's many of these transfers. Um, land reclamation, it's quite easy for the government to take land in China. And that's a kind of wealth transfer. You take land away from the people living there and you transfer it for government projects, et cetera. But there are three taxes that are particularly important, uh, three of these hidden taxes. And every one of the Asian miracle countries had these three conditions. Um, the first is an undervalued currency. And it's important to understand how an undervalued currency works. Um, when your currency is undervalued, that increases the price of imports. Households are always net importers. Maybe subsistence farmers aren't, but everybody else is a net importer. So when you have an undervalued currency, it's like a consumption tax. So it reduces disposable household income by the amount of that consumption tax. And of course, it's a subsidy to the tradable goods sector. So it's a direct transfer of wealth from the household sector to the tradable goods sector. 
By the way, the reason countries with undervalued currencies run, tend to run trade surpluses is not really because an undervalued currency means that you're cheaper. Um, I, I won't get into a long explanation of that, but I can prove to you quite easily that it doesn't have to do with pricing. It's an undervalued currency tends to force up the savings rate. And when the savings of any country exceeds the investment of that country, by definition, it must run a current account surplus. Um, so the way the undervalued uh, currency works is directly by forcing up the savings rate. And it forces up the savings rate not by causing the Japanese or the Chinese to save more money, but rather by reducing their share of GDP and, and by doing so reducing the consumption share of GDP. So remember, savings is just GDP minus consumption. So if you reduce the consumption share, you're pushing up the savings share. So that's one tax. The second really important tax is that wage growth tends to lag um, uh, uh, productivity growth. And in China, that was the case until roughly 2010. Why does that matter? Because when wages grow more slowly than productivity, that means workers are retaining a smaller and smaller share of what they're producing. So it's like a tax on workers. And who benefits? Well, obviously employers. So again, you get this transfer of wealth from workers to employers. So household income, its share of total goods and services produced declines, and with it consumption declines, and so the savings rate goes up. It's interesting because low wage growth works a lot like an undervalued currency. So when we yell and scream about currency manipulation, we've got to remember that it's not just the currency. Anything that forces the savings rate up above the investment rate must lead to a current account surplus. Um, and it doesn't have to work through prices. The third tax is the hardest to explain. But I think by now it's widely accepted and it is the most important of these taxes, and that's what we call financial repression. In a financially repressed system, typically uh, savers have a limited number of saving options. Usually it's limited to the banking system, and interest rates within the banking system are set by the central authorities very, very low. If you artificially lower um, the interest rate, all you're doing is transferring wealth from the lender to the borrower, right? And who are the lenders? Ultimately, the household sector are the lenders because of their savings in the banking system. In China, in Japan, there was very little consumer borrowing, household borrowing. And who are the borrowers? Well, large corporations, uh, state-owned enterprises, real estate developers, all the producers of GDP. It's the financial repression tax that we really have to understand. This may be, if there's only one thing you need to understand about China in the, in the last four decades from an economic point of view, it's the importance of this financial repression tax. In China, it was huge until, until basically 2011, 2012. That's when it collapsed, and I'll get into that in a minute. But to give you a sense of how high it was, the, 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 um, the lending rate should be broadly in line. We have a big argument about what is the correct lending rate, what is the natural interest rate but it should be broadly in line with nominal GDP. In China, for much of this period, nominal GDP as opposed to real, nominal GDP was growing anywhere from 16 to 20%. The GDP deflator, which is what we use as the inflation measure, was anywhere from 8 to 10%. So we had real growth rates of around 10%. Um, if in that condition you were asked what is the correct lending rate for low-risk lending? Economists would have a huge argument, but it would probably be somewhere between 15 and 20 percent, certainly more than 10 percent. But the lending rate for much of this period was 7 percent. So it was an extraordinarily low lending rate. It was, it was probably negative almost every year in real terms. Um, the uh, deposit rate was roughly three and a half percentage points. So that means the spread, the, the profit for the bankers was about three and a half percentage point, which is sort of double what is typical for developing countries. This is really important because it means that a huge amount of savings, and depending on what you think the right deposit rate is, it could be 4%, 5%, 6% of savings, every year was taken away from the household sector, 
in the form of a reduction in the value of their savings that was greater than the increase in their savings caused by the interest rate and transferred to the banks and to borrowers. It was a huge transfer. Um, I did a back of the envelope calculation. I should warn you, I, I'm, I'm a mathematician. I used to be a physics, a physics major as an undergrad. Um, and I think the only, I hope there's no economist here, I think the only appropriate mathematics for economists should basically be arithmetic. <laughs> Little bit of probability theory, some calculus, that's about it. The, the, the math that economists use is so complicated that my physics friends don't understand it and they misuse it constantly. I, I, I can do a whole lecture about that, but I won't. Um, um, but the important point to remember here is this very, very low interest rate has a whole bunch of effects, but I did a really quick, dirty, back of the envelope calculation, and I figured that between five and eight percentage points of GDP was transferred every year from the household sector. That's a huge amount. Um, the IMF then did a much cleverer study, or study than I could ever do. It took them weeks and weeks with lots of people doing it, and their conclusion was 4 to 8 percent. And the World Bank came out with 5 percent. So we're all in the same ballpark. That's a big number that's being transferred. So remember, this is being transferred away from the household sector uh, towards borrowers. And so, of course, during this period, GDP was growing very, very quickly, or 10%. Household income was growing 7 or 8%. Now, that's a great number. Most countries would kill to have household income grow at 7 to 8%. But the important thing to remember is that during this entire period, the household income share of GDP was getting smaller and smaller, right? If GDP is growing at 10 and household income is growing at 7 or 8, clearly every year household income is a smaller share. And unless the Chinese were to reduce their savings as quickly as their share of GDP declined, then uh, consumption also must decline as a share of GDP. And it did. And as consumption declines, the saving rates go up. Not because the Chinese were behaving more prudently or thriftily or anything like that, simply because they were given a smaller and smaller share of GDP. So is this a bad model? Oh, I'm sorry. I'm still on. This is the first problem. Gershon Krohn said there were two problems. The first is insufficient savings. So the right policy for all of these countries that are going to run this investment-driven growth miracle is to force up the savings rate by constraining the growth in household income. Um, and that's, that happened. The second important point that Gershon Krohn uh, pointed out was that developing countries have a very bad track record of investing in productive investments, especially infrastructure. And again, it's easy to understand why. If you don't have clear property rules, if you have political instability, lots of other things, it's unlikely that the private sector is going to invest in projects in which there is a very long payoff or in which it's very easy for the state to confiscate the project. So Gershon Krohn's other recommendation was you have to centralize the investment decision process. And every one of these countries more or less did that in, in, in different ways. Um, so does this model work? It worked spectacularly. Um, Chinese growth was so high because uh, all of these enormous subsidies to growth, um, but even though the household sector was paying these enormous subsidies, the growth rate was so high that the household sector did very, very well. And this happens in every one of the countries, or almost everyone, that's tried this model. In the beginning, real wealth grows very quickly. Household wealth grows more slowly, but still very quickly. And so it seems like a great model. So uh, at what point do you stop this model? At what point do you challenge Albert Hirschman's problem? It turns out that the answer is very simple. You have to abandon the model when you are no longer able to channel all of this credit into investments that are productive. As long as the investments are productive, and all I mean by that is that the, the addition in wealth that they bring to China is greater than the cost of the investment, um, you should keep doing this. But the moment you reach some point 
at which the investments start to become non-productive, you should stop because now you're actually wasting wealth. You're destroying wealth as you're growing. You're creating huge economic activity and your GDP numbers may be high, but your wealth is no longer growing. Um, every country that has had this growth miracle has run into this problem. Now, a lot of people say, but China, has, China is so poor, its capital levels are so low compared to, say, the United States, that it'll be decades before China runs out of investment opportunities. And I'm going to make another quick detour. It's so easy for me to, 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 to make detours. But we need to understand what is the difference between a rich country and a poor country. The difference is not that rich countries have more bridges, more capital invested. It's got to be something else, and I would argue it's some constellation of institutions, legal, financial, educational, et cetera, that allow individuals in that country or, or businesses in that country to use resources more productively. So a rich country is not rich because it invests more. A rich country invests more because it is rich. And it is rich because it has the right set of institutions. And if I could tell you what those are, I would automatically get a Nobel Prize. It's hard to figure it out. But there's a lot of reasons for, uh, for uh, believing that. And I'll ask you just to accept it on faith. China, in other words, had an optimal amount of investment that was way below the United States, way below any rich country. Um, so at some point, it had, because it had the fastest growth rate in investment in history, at some point it reached that optimal level and it began misallocating investment. I was speaking to uh, one of my clients earlier this morning and we agreed that China and the United States should swap train systems. China's train system, it takes me four hours to go from Beijing to Shanghai, and not much less to go from New York to Washington, which is absurd. Um, China's uh, high-speed rail network is wonderful, but it's too good given the level of productivity. And in the US, we have a really uh, terrible train system. Um, but as China began continuing to invest in all of these projects, you saw lots of GDP, because GDP measures activity, not wealth. But it was no longer getting wealthy at anywhere near the pace at which its debt was growing. Debt, in other words, were, was growing faster than debt servicing capacity. Again, this has happened in every one of the growth miracle countries. And of course, if debt is growing faster than debt servicing capacity, that's almost the definition of an unsustainable growth in debt. In fact, it is the definition. So China's debt was growing unsustainably at some point. When, I would argue in the late 1990s, lots of people disagreed very strongly, but by now everyone agrees that, it, that it's happening, and they'll say it happened in 2007, 2008. It doesn't matter when it began, but at some point, debt began to grow faster than debt servicing capacity. Um, so to me, I would think of that as the third stage. You have this model in place, but it's no longer generating wealth, or, it's, or certainly not as quickly as it used to. Now it's creating debt. And it's interesting to me that every single country that has had an investment growth miracle has followed it either with a debt crisis or with a period of stagnation driven by rising and high levels of debt, like Japan after 1990. I don't think that's a coincidence. I think that's the way the model works. Um, <clears throat> so what must Beijing do? Well, clearly, they must change the growth model. And instead of continuing to shovel money into investment, they must now make the kinds of reforms, the institutional reforms, that will allow Chinese to behave more productively. Before I went to Peking University, I used to teach at Tsinghua, which they often call the MIT of China. And every time the Nobel Prizes came out, there was all of this hair pulling, et cetera. Why can't we do it? And the typical joke among the Tsinghua students was how do you turn a Tsinghua student into a high-tech entrepreneur? And the answer was, get him an apartment in San Francisco. <laughs> and that's not a joke. Uh, we all know Nigerians, Indians, Chinese, they're incredibly productive in California or, or, or the United States, much less productive than they are at home. And I would argue that that must be because of the institutions that allow you to behave more productively. That's what China's got to figure out. And it's a tough question. But those are the types of reforms it needs to put into place. But notice many of those reforms are, <coughs> are harking back to the period of liberalizing reforms. They mean eliminating constraints, removing constraints on the ability of Chinese businesses and Chinese individuals 
to behave more productively than they already are. Um, so not surprisingly, there must be political opposition to those types of changes, and there is. In, in 2007, in March 2007, uh, China formally acknowledged the deep imbalances and the deep problems being created by those imbalances. Premier Wen gave his, uh, very, Wen Jiabao was the premier uh, uh, then, he gave his very famous uh, four uns speech. I always forget the fourth, but it's China is uncoordinated, unbalanced, unequal, and unsomething else. Um, and he promised that we would begin rebalancing the economy immediately. That was the top priority of the economic policy making in Beijing. Um, so a lot of economists who didn't believe China had a problem were able to switch very quickly and say, well, China has a problem, but it's solved because Beijing recognizes it, and once they recognize it, they solve all of their problems overnight. It's a big myth. Beijing is very good at solving problems when you can solve them by increasing investment. But they haven't been able to solve other types of problems. They're quite hard to solve. So a couple of us were very skeptical, and we said they're not going to pull it off. And it won't surprise you to hear that from 2011, for the next five years, the imbalances continued to get worse. The savings rate rose, the consumption rate declined at a faster rate than ever. So clearly they didn't solve the problem. Now, there is a phrase that we often see in the Chinese press, and it started appearing in 2008, 2009, and that's not a coincidence, I would argue. It was the phrase vested interests. And the vested interests argument was, we know what to do, but we can't do it because of the vested interests. Again, classic, this is exactly what Albert Hirschman would have told us would happen. Um, so China nonetheless has to implement these reforms. So if you were advising the next, when I say next, I mean back in 2008, 2009, the next head of China, um, and if you had read uh, Darren Asimoglu's papers and, and the history of attempts to implement these reforms, you would have probably advised the next head to do one of two things. Turn China into a democracy in the next two to three years. Tough or centralized power. Because in the 1990s and in the first decade, the last decade, um, there was a huge decentralization of power as uh, capital flowed into the provinces and we saw uh, local, provincial, and municipal governments control the banking system. Uh, and this was the problem of the vested interest. This was why uh, um, Wen Jiabao, this, at least I would argue, why Wen Jiabao was not able to implement the reforms that he promised. So if, you, if you're not uh, very confident about recommending democracy, then you should probably recommend a centralization of power, a re-centralization of power. In fact, my seminar at, uh, at Peking University in 2009, they outlined what a successful rebalancing must look like. Step one, you must radically re-centralize power. And that's exactly what Xi Jinping did. Uh, we didn't predict the soap opera and the Boshilai stuff and all that. Um, but they predicted that the next leader has to re-centralize power or there's no way they're going to rebalance. Um, they predicted a few other things that turned out to be pretty accurate. Uh, I would like to take credit, but they're really smart kids. Um, they predicted that once the rebalancing began, and I've stolen this from them, I'm known as the three to four percent guy. Once the rebalancing began, it was not possible for growth rates to exceed, on average, 3 to 4% over the decade of rebalancing. And if it does exceed that, it'll not be a decade, it'll be a longer period of time. And that's the best case scenario. People keep saying, I'm the guy who predicted 3 to 4%, and I said, no, I never predicted that. I said 3 to 4% would be the average growth rate at best if everything works out well. And there's a good chance that it, that it uh, turns out worse. But this is, the set, this is the set of challenges that Xi Jinping and his administration must face. And it is a very difficult challenge. And it is very hard to be successful. The historic precedents are very, very clear. Very few countries pulled this off. Um, I met with, I can't really mention his name, but he was a very senior official in Russia. And we had this big discussion about China. And when we finished, he told me, he agreed with everything. But when we finished, he told me something that I thought was really uh, um, worrying to me. He said, you know, you're American. You don't understand adjustment. And he's right. The U.S. is pretty good at adjusting. It adjusts quickly. Um, 
He said, I'm Russian. We know about adjustments. And he said, if China pulls this off, it will be unique in history. And you should never bet on something that will be unique in history. So he's more pessimistic than I am. But I think the Russians sort of, I think there's a psychological joy there, <laughs> maybe. Um, but um, so it's going to be a very difficult process. And the key is going to be the centralization of power and his ability to implement the reforms. What are these reforms? Uh, I was at the IMF yesterday and it was a very frustrating experience because I think they still, I think most people still don't recognize the problems that China faces. One of the things that really intrigues me is that if you look at countries that are perceived as having debt problems, perceived as having too much debt, you won't be surprised to know there's quite a few of those in say the last 200 years of economic history, I cannot find a single case in which that country was able to reform and grow its way out of debt. In every single case, there had to be debt forgiveness. And the debt forgiveness could be formal. Um, the countries could default on their debt and get a write down of the debt, like the famous Brady bonds of the 1990s. Or it could be an informal debt forgiveness. You can use inflation to wipe away the debt, but that doesn't mean the debt disappears. It simply means that people who were long monetary assets against their wishes usually ended up forgiving, paying for part of this debt. I haven't found any exception. Now, I had this discussion with um, the economics editor of the Financial Times, Martin Wolf, and about six days after the discussion, I was in London, came back to Beijing, I got an email from him and said, yes, there is an exception. England after the, the Napoleonic Wars. Now, I'm not sure that's an exception, but if it is, it's interesting that he had to go back 200 years to find this exception. Now, my next book is gonna be about debt and why it matters, why countries that are overly indebted never grow out of their debt without implicitly getting debt forgiveness, or explicitly. Um, but if it's true, if, it, if it's not true, we should at least explain why no one's been able to do it in history, and I haven't found anyone to explain it. But if it's true, that means what, what uh, uh, Beijing has to do is deleverage. It must pay down the debt. How do you do that? Um, well, basically, you have to sell government assets. And there are two types of government assets. There's real estate and there's uh, shares in state-owned enterprises. You can't really sell real estate because too much of the banking system is tied up with real estate values, and that could be bad for the banks in the short term, good in the long term. Um, so you have to basically privatize companies. It's arithmetically the only way out I can figure. Um, but that's the political problem, because when you privatize companies, you take them out of state hands, you take away the ability of those companies to enrich the so-called vested interests. And this is something that people talk about a great deal in China. A lot of people are surprised that I say this. They say, why aren't they kicking you out of the country? Because that's what they're talking about in China. I'm not saying anything surprising. We know what the problem is, is you've got to transfer wealth from the state sector to the household sector. And if you look at the third plan of reforms from 2013, they all do that. But it's hard to do that because transferring wealth means taking it away from someone who's likely to be quite powerful, who's going to oppose that transfer. So this is why I would argue it's crucially important that Xi Jinping centralizes power to the point where he can force through those transfers. Um, I'll say one other thing about the reforms that need to be done, and that is if you reduce, if you want to reduce debt, you have to reduce investment because of the way it's working now, investment is being misallocated even worse than ever. But if you reduce investment, you've got to fire workers, so unemployment goes up. If you don't want unemployment to go up, you've got to find another source of demand. Now, there's three sources of demand available. One is other investment, productive investment. So you'll hear lots of economists say, you know, all China has to do is reform the financial system sufficiently that it stops making bad lending decisions and makes good lending decisions. And they're right. And all I have to do if I want to stop working is win one of those really big lottery prizes. <laughs> it works. I, I'll be able to stop working if I win, but don't count on it. Again, I can't find in history a single case of a country that has managed such radical reforms in a short period of time. The exception might be Chile in the late 70s and early 80s, but remember, Chile had a political crisis and a total collapse in its banking system 
They were desperate. And maybe that's what it takes to impose that radical ascent, uh, set of reforms. So I don't think productive investment is going to replace the non-productive investment quickly enough. So what else can you do? Well, another source of demand is the current account surplus. So maybe China can cause the current account surplus to explode. Uh, the problem is that everybody has the same strategy. And I'm surprised that people aren't more angry at the irresponsibility of Europe. Three years ago, Europe had a balanced account. Today, it has probably the biggest current account surplus as a share of global GDP in history. It exploded. Uh, and Japan has also got the same strategy, caused the current account surplus to grow. Over the last two years, nobody noticed it. Why? Because metal prices collapsed and energy prices collapsed. So those huge surpluses were absorbed unwillingly by the uh, metal and energy producers. But I don't think they can uh, adjust much more. I don't think they can absorb much more. In fact, a country like Brazil is going to switch from deficit this last year to surplus this year because it's so badly hurt they simply can't import anymore. So they're going to go into surplus. So who's got to absorb that, uh, that surplus is going to be the U.S. If the U.S. doesn't, there's a big problem in China, Europe, and Japan. And if the U.S. does, there's going to be a problem in the U.S. I have no idea how, how we resolve that, but that's going to be an important consideration this year and next year, how we resolve that. Um, so that's, uh, I'm going to leave it there in a very open way because, uh, quite honestly, I don't know what happens next. Um, the, the outlook is, it's dangerous to be optimistic because what China needs to do is not talk about all of these reforms that economists love to talk about, marginal improvements in productivity. That's never worked. They have to aggressively increase the household income share. Oh, I'm sorry, I forgot. There's a third source of demand, and that's consumption, of course. Right? I mentioned investment. I get really scattered when I'm, uh, I'm uh, um, jet-lagged. But we can't do investment, can't do the current account surplus, so consumption. But how do you get consumption to rise when you're firing workers because you're closing down investment? Well, the only way is transfers of wealth from the state sector to the household sector. So it's the same problem. The, the two big problems that China has to resolve quickly are both solved the same way through transfers of wealth, but they both face the same ferocious political opposition. So that's where China is today. I don't know if Xi Jinping is in a position where he feels confident enough to implement the reforms. And none of us really, I mean, there's maybe 100, 150 people who can tell you an intelligent answer to that, and they won't. Um, but that's one of the things we have to watch. How confident does Xi Jinping think he is? How confident is he in his ability to implement the reforms? And is he right to be so confident? Or does he need to continue waiting? And I don't know how much time we have. Um, and wealth transfers. Watch wealth transfers in China very closely because that's the best signal that Xi Jinping is actually doing what needs to be done in order to force through this adjustment. So the last thing I'll say, and it's a very pessimistic thing, I, I apologize, but if you look at countries that have adjusted from this kind of growth, there's really theoretically three ways to adjust, but from history there's only been two ways. Remember, we've got to increase the household income share of GDP. So the U.S. did that from 1930 to 1933. I think GDP was down 35%. Household income was down about half that. Brutally painful, but notice the household income share increased. Um, Japan, over 20 years, GDP growth was around half a percent. Household income growth was, there's different measures for it, but it was probably around one and a half percent. So over 20 years, Japan also rebalanced. I'm, I'm afraid it's now going in the opposite direction. But anyway, those seem to be the two models that history has given us. Either a catastrophic, rapid adjustment, which is probably better over the long term, but it's socially and politically very painful over the short term, or a long period of stagnation. And to see why I think the second solution from an economic point of view is worse, I often uh, point out that Japan used to be 17% of the world GDP, and today it's around 6%. I don't think any country has done that except in times of war, uh, after it's been destroyed by war. 
So that's an astonishing decline in its relative size in the world economy. Um, so those are the two options. There is a third option, theoretical, but I can't find any case of a country that pulled it off. And the third option, of course, is instead of having GDP go negative and household income go slightly less negative, or having GDP flatline and household income slightly better, in theory, you could have household income soar and GDP lag behind it. Uh, but like I said, no one has ever done that, and I don't know how you do that when you're bringing investment down. Somehow you've got to get all of this growth in household income. And the only way I can think of it is through major transfers of wealth from the state sector. So those are the options facing China, and they're quite difficult. So I'll stop. I think I went way over my time, but I'll stop here and open it up to questions or comments or disagreements.